Good afternoon, everyone. I think people are, are still entering after lunch. So we've we've started recording the afternoon session. I'm Nida Alfilage. I'm from the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And I'm also co-chair with Joe Judge, um, as Chris mentioned earlier, of the Species Survival Working Group. Um, so welcome back. I hope everyone's had a, a good quick break and managed to eat something. Um, we're delighted to continue our symposium on um, conservation translocations in development mitigations. Um, thanks to all the uh, fantastic speakers this morning. It was a really interesting session. Um, and I'm delighted to be chairing this afternoon session. Um, and first, I'm going to introduce to you Aileen Finger, who's going to talk to us about genetics and genomic considerations. Um, so I'll just quickly give you a bit of a background um, about Aileen. She's a conservation scientist at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Her research combines applied conservation and genetic research and focuses on the conservation and restoration of threatened and important plant species. She leads on a science-led pl um, plant conservation translocation program at RBGE, which includes the use of ex situ collections, conservation horticultural practice and biosecurity expertise um, in order to maximize the long-term success of conservation translocations. And she works collaboratively with landowners and partners across Scotland to ensure coordinated conservation efforts. So thank you very much, Aileen, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I was saying, I hope my voice is gonna hold because I may sound a bit um, scratchy after having a cold. Um, and I'm gonna assume that everything is working. Uh, otherwise someone will probably tell me. So- Yes, it's uh, working. It's working very well, thanks. Perfect. So. Yeah, delighted to be here and talk about genetics. I love talking about genetics uh, when people let me. So um, as Nida was saying, so we have um, just going to very quickly introduce like um, cons a larger plant conservation translocation project, uh, which is a three year core program at RBGE. Um, it's a three year Scottish government's nature restoration fund. And the aim is to safeguard 10 priority Scottish plant species in large genetically diverse ex situ collections. Um, and then to the, with the aim to then translocate them back into new sites where hopefully we're gonna create resilient and adaptable populations. So why am I mentioning this program? Um, and that is because um, every species um, has different genetic considerations. And this is where the complexity start with genetics because <laughs> um, population conservation genetics is a very broad topic. So and lots of different things that we can do and where we can use genetics to help um, conservation programs. So um, one of these things, um, so for the for this project, um, and also just to say the focus will be a little bit on plants, but the principles are all the same for plants, animals, humans. It's very, very similar um, principles here. So uh, for some of the species, and that is mainly true for the trees, um, for example, one consideration is genetic purity. So, and if you want animal uh, equivalent examples for that, so the wild apple we're, we're working on, uh, the equivalent for that would probably be the wild cat. Both are threatened by hybridization. And we're trying to really keep this, the purity of the original of the crop wild relative in our case, uh, to ensure that this survives. Um, same for the service trees on which are three endemic microspecies on Erin. So there too, we want to maintain the purity of these species. Um, and then for the witch elm, for example, we're trying to only use certain uh, trees or genotypes that are disease resistant. So again, the equi equivalent, if I can say that properly for um, animals would be again, uh, the often mentioned um, Tasmanian devil example that Martin mentioned. So we're just using specific genotypes. But I guess the most, uh, most of the translocations we do will probably be um, because species are really rare and um, we want to increase the, the numbers that we have in the wild. And that is the case for all our herbaceous species in, in, in this program. And, and there, the main uh, thing we want to concentrate on is to increase the genetic diversity and avoid inbreeding, the two main principles. Um, and we can do that by creating large connected populations uh, to ensure that we have self-sustaining populations long-term. And 
Um, so most of these species were usually, usually what happens is they are more widespread. So, and the principle behind the population genetic theory is, so we have species that used to be more widespread, then we have habitat fragmentation or over exploitation or whatever reasons, and they become really small and isolated. And small and isolated populations, um, there's a higher risk of having elevated inbreeding. Inbreeding isn't great, again, same for humans, same for plants and animals, because it leads to the expression of deleterious or harmful alleles. Um, and population reduction isolation is also leading to a loss of genetic diversity and all of that together can lead to an elevated risk of extinction. Now, this is an example, or this is the mechanism in the wild, but it's the same principle that can happen during a translocation process. So if we're creating a new population and it's a small isolated population, we will eventually have the same issues, high levels of inbreeding, low genetic diversity, and in, in in that case, it would be a uh, reduced success. Now, there are some things that we can do to increase the success, um, either uh, in wild populations, increase their survival, or in translocations to increase the success. And two of which, um, uh, or the, they can be called genetic rescue and gene flow, which is pretty much the same thing. So genetic rescue is an increase in fitness of small populations resulting from, uh, from the elevation of inbreeding depression by immigrants. So in other words, if we have small and inbred populations, we bring new individuals or new genes into these populations, that should increase the fitness. Um, and again, um, that is pretty much if we have gene flow and we connect small isolated populations, that is the same principle. So we have individuals and genes that can mix and cross. And that um, is then counteracting the negative effects from inbreeding. So. There are uh, the major genetic uh, concern, major genetic concerns that we have are inbreeding depression because it has negative impacts on the reproduction and survival of individuals or populations. So for plants that would be whatever reduced seed viability, lower lower growth, um, and you know uh, so lower survival, for example. And in the long term, the loss of genetic diversity um, can result in loss of adaptive potential. And that is because um, the uh, genetic diversity is the basis for any any sort of um, for, for, for adaptation pretty much. So if we have climate change or the outbreak of diseases, the more diversity we have, the more likely we are that we can adapt to these things. So these are the two really important things. Avoid inbreeding depression and uh, increase, well, avoid the loss of genetic diversity. Now, to avoid the loss of genetic diversity, uh, uh, papa, I mean, to avoid the inbreeding depression, sorry, um, what we need, according to literature and latest findings, is a minimum population size of 5,000 individuals. Yeah, well, that is not going to happen, I think. And I think, I don't know all restoration, translocation projects, but I think there won't be many, if any at all, that use 5,000 individuals. Um, now, the alternative to that is create gene flow. So small population, smaller populations, but those that yeah populations that are genetically connected, so either close enough geographically or have any other means of of um, exchanging genes. Even then, we need large numbers. So the main um, message here is when we do translocations, we want to think big in terms of numbers. So and then the things we do and how we use genetics um, here at RBG as an example um, and conservation translocations to conserve species is the first step is to, to do a genetic study. And sometimes there's genetic data already available, um, so that makes it easier. But the genetic um, study can help us detect whether there are any issues. In most cases, there are. If we're working on rare species, that is usually the case, but uh, we can see whether we have high levels of inbreeding, whether we have low diversity and so on. We can determine appropriate source populations for translocations and for reinforcements. Um, uh, it's also important to select the correct um, genetic material to avoid genetic swamping, which is, um, uh, which is the interruption of local adaptation. So we want to prevent that. If there is risk, we may rather want to create new populations which are far away from wild populations. And then also to say, not everyone has the 
skills to do um, or the labs to do the genetic work and there's always potential to collaborate with research institutes so that shouldn't hold anyone back um, and there are student projects you know there are always people who are keen um, to help with that and it doesn't have to be necessarily expensive it can be it can be expensive but it doesn't have to be depending on the questions so then we grow and breed individuals for translocations, um, collect wild material, and we try to really maximize the, the genetic diversity that we can collect from diff as many different populations as possible. Um, during the breeding or growing process, we want to minimize kinship and inbreeding. Hybridization can also happen, and the adaptation to very comfortable um, conditions in, <laughs> in uh, captivity or in, in the nursery. So it needs to be a swift-ish process. Um, then we can test for the potential for genetic rescue or the opposite, which is outbreeding depression. So whether when we mix things, whether that's going to increase fitness or when we mix things, whether that is going to reduce uh, fitness. Um, and then we conduct, conduct our translocations um, and choose appropriate individuals, which again, genetics will help us with remembering that ideally we have 5,000 individuals for each translocation site. If we can, um, but can you imagine the space that would require as well to to breed and grow these individuals? So it's very tricky. Um, and then obviously choose appropriate locations. And again, the genetics can tell us whether we want to connect with wild populations or not. And then finally, monitor the success of failure, as has been highlighted. Um, and uh, especially um, thinking about Richard's talk about um, detectability for some of the animal species less important for plants i guess but genetic monitoring can be could potentially be quite helpful there so and the best way of uh, showing an example of the impact of genetic um genetics on a restoration project is by giving an example and it's going to be a plant example um and i'm working or we've done some work on the um alpine blue south thistles the cervital alpina which um, used to be more widespread. It's very attractive with these deep blue violet flowers, um, about one and a half meters tall. So really tall, nice, pretty plant. It's really common in central European mountain ranges and in Scandinavia, but in the UK, where are we there? Um, it's really, really rare. We have four populations left, all four within the Cairngorms National Park. Um, so first step, as I said, we looked at the genetics um, at the genetic condition of the populations because as you can see so these are the four populations and they are really small and are on very precarious locations on these very steep slimy ledges <laughs> so it's not easy to get there in the first place but um, they escape grazing on these steep ledges so because any uh, catastrophic event could actually take any of these populations out completely uh, we thought that translocations is actually a very good and appropriate method here. And the genetic data showed, I mean, we just used a fairly simple approach using microscopic loci, which are pretty much 15 small bits of DNA. And the, the data shows that we have less than 20 plants per population. Um, and on top of that, we have a high relatedness, so um, we have cousins and full sips. Uh, on these ledges, so really high levels of inbreeding, but also the next generation um, would then have even higher levels of inbreeding. We have low diversity compared to uh, more larger Norwegian, uh, larger, and larger and widespread Norwegian populations, and there's no gene flow between populations, so they're really small, isolated populations. Now, we know that, uh, again, the 5,000 individuals, um, we don't have these in these populations. So. Um, we know that if we just use the material as it is and plant it back out, we're going to have a very poor translocation site. So how do we get around that? Um, so we brought uh, individuals from all populations into the nursery where we bulked the material up. It's quite easy. So these, these species, you can uh, divide the rootstock um, so you, you can increase your numbers fairly quickly. Um, and having genetically identical plants, which which is what happens when you divide them, is not ideal, but we can do some experiments with these plants, and one of which is a genetic rescue experiment. So, um, and this is to see whether we can increase plant fitness um, or, um, yeah, pretty much by, by crossing between these plants. So that's what we've done. 
Um, we have the four Scottish populations and some plants from Norway as well. And we hand pollinated uh, in all sorts of different combinations. And by that, increase or decrease the levels of inbreeding. Um, so our treatment, treatments are on the top right. So when we selved, obviously, that was really high level of inbreeding. When we crossed within populations, there was medium levels of inbreeding and so on. And then we crossed between UK populations, which is outbreeding, and then um, between UK and Norwegian populations. So the, the inbreeding levels really went down there. So in the nursery, to make it really quick and short, when we cross between populations and when we lowered the inbreeding, um, our plants tended to grow bigger, our survival prospects tended to be higher, and plants matured more quickly. Now, but that was in the nursery. So, so the question is, what happens when we then plant these individuals back out into the wild, into the really harsh Scottish environments? And pretty much, I'm just going to show the results of one translocation site, which is at Mar Lodge in the Cairngorms, um, and that is two years after planting, we have 88% survival rate overall. Um, and I'm just showing this one result because it's the same, exactly the same for all five sites that we planted into. Um, and as a measure of success, we've got survival, plant size and flowering. And I'll quickly explain the diagram. But we, so we've got our treatments at the bottom, um, so self within, then the original wild rootstock um, crossed and crossed with Norway. So pretty much what that is, we went from on the left, you've got high inbreeding, on the right, you've got the low inbreeding. And then you've got the number that we had for each of these categories at the bottom there as well. And so like a traffic light system, um, here it is like red colors are bad. So the really red ones are dead. And then um, the um, orange ones are pretty much on their way there. Uh, and the more green you have, the better it is. And as you can see very quickly, the more you go to the right, so the lower inbreeding becomes, the more green you have in your um, in, in your proportions of plants there. Um, Aileen, so, five, yeah? to five minutes left, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and the same for uh, the flowering on the right. So the, the lower the inbreeding, the more likely they were to flower. Um, so that was like really um, like a confirmation that when we decrease inbreeding, we can really improve the, um, the success of these translocations. So, and the summary of all of that is that um, obviously, different genetic considerations are important for different species, uh, and the exact considerations depend on the aim of the translocations. Um, but the major genetic concerns for any translocation, for any wild population, is to avoid inbreeding depression and to increase genetic diversity or avoid the loss of genetic diversity. So, um, altogether, um, inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity obviously depends on the population size. And to avoid inbreeding depression, we need a minimum of 5,000 individuals. Um, so whatever we do when we do translocations, uh, we really want to think about translocating as many individuals as possible. Um, uh, and then if that is not possible, we can preserve new populations as dynamic entities um, by creating or maintaining gene flow between populations as that is the same principle. They can then exchange genes. Um, and when we're reinforcing um, po wild populations, it's really important to use the appropriate genetic material to avoid genetic swamping because it interrupts local adaptation. And we can increase the success of translocations by using cross genetic material, but, but this needs to be tested for every single species. We can't just assume that if it works for one species, it's going to be the same for all the others. So, and then, yeah, finally, just, you know, if <clears throat> um, any translocation project can include uh, genetics, even if we don't have a lab, um, because there are opportunities to collaborate with research institutes and there are many students that I'm sure would love to have some some um, genetic projects. So, um, yeah, that's it pretty much. Um, I think, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Aileen. It was a, a fascinating whistle-stop tour through um, some kind of critical work there for really small populations. Um, you've pretty much stuck perfectly to time. So I think we'll save questions um, and we'll move on to the next speaker. So just a reminder to all the delegates, if you have got questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And if you want to direct the questions to a particular speaker, 
um, please flag that as well. But also uh, feel free to put in general questions as well. So thank you very much, Aileen. And we'll move on to our next speaker, Lauren Harrington, um, who's going to talk about welfare considerations. Um, Lauren, are you there? Yes, I am. Lovely. Um, but it says that I can't share my screen ah. while you're sharing. All right. Aileen, are you able to stop sharing? Yeah, no. I'm trying to find the button, actually. Pause sharing. Stop sharing. Here we go. Sorry. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Lauren, if you'd like to share your first slide and I can introduce you. Um, so Lauren has worked at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at Oxford University for over 20 years. And she's now, oh, sorry, that was me with, with Hayley's timer. Um, she's now a senior research fellow there and also an independent researcher. Her first job after graduation was working on the very first reintroductions of black-footed ferrets in the wild in the early 1990s. So species reintroductions and translocations have always been a special interest for Lauren. And she's since been involved as an independent monitoring partner with um, then SNH in the beaver release trial at Napdale in Scotland. And she's collaborated widely on reintroductions of European mink in Spain and Estonia. So her research covers diverse topics, but her main focus is currently in animal welfare in conservation. So over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Nida. Can you hear me and can you see my screen okay now? Yes, perfectly. Both. Super, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly today about animal welfare considerations. Um, I'm going to be drawing on examples from reintroductions and translocations in conservation because that is where my experience is. But really, when we're thinking about animal welfare and talking about physically moving animals from one place to another, the issues are very much the same. I think this is a bit different from other speakers today um, who've highlighted differences in the motivations and goals of conservation translocations and mitigation translocations. There's definitely going to be less science in my talk. and Much of what I'm going to talk about is really common sense, but it is true that animal welfare um, is often neglected. So what I'm hoping to do today is to prompt people to think more clearly about animal welfare in translocations. So why care about animal welfare? Well, first, it is a legal obligation. The Animal Welfare Act protects the welfare of vertebrate animals kept by humans on a temporary or permanent basis, even if that's only for a short time. So although the Act focuses on domestic animals, it applies to any wild animal while it's held captive or restrained by human actions. Essentially, this means that during this time, while the animal's held, any act, or importantly, any failure to act that causes the animal to suffer unnecessarily is an offence. There's also a moral obligation, put very simply, it's the right thing to do. And then there is accountability. Much more is now known about animal sentience and the capacity of animals to suffer. In conservation, uh, I think there is increasing oversight in terms of what we can do, and sometimes increasing criticism of conservation practice in terms of how it can impact animal welfare. Some of that, in my opinion, goes slightly too far, but that's a whole discussion in its own right that we don't have time for now. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there is an increasing call for us in conservation and in other fields to be accountable for our actions in terms of animal welfare. I think it's right that we should be. Um, this is also particularly important in terms of public support, of course, which is often vital for the success of the project. Finally, this is simple logic, but the better condition your animals are in, in terms of their health and mental state, the more likely they are to survive, establish, reproduce, and contribute to a viable population in their new location. So in other words, greater consideration of animal welfare, although it's important in its own right, also has considerable potential to contribute to conservation success. So it can be a kind of win-win really. So before we get into discussing animal welfare, there are some definitions that are useful to bear in mind. Animal welfare focuses on individual animals. It requires that we treat animals in a humane manner and avoid unnecessary suffering. Animal rights is slightly different. It also focuses on individual animals, but it differs from animal welfare in that animal rights proponents believe that violation of, for example, the right to life is wrong, regardless of whether or not the animal suffers and regardless of the reason for the action or the broader consequences. Conservation is motivated by an environmental ethic that values and focuses on the natural environment. Conservation biologists tend to be concerned with the long -time term viability of populations and the continued existence of species, biotic communities and ecosystems as wholes, with the aim of protecting and preserving biological uh, diversity. So all of these ethical positions are centered around animals, but there can sometimes be conflict. 
They're also often interlinked. And in the case of translocations of animals for development mitigation, the primary goals of saving individual animals from being killed and avoiding a reduction in the conservation status of a population crosses both animal welfare and conservation ethics. So in order to treat animals in a humane manner to ensure they don't suffer unnecessarily, we need to understand and to keep in mind what an animal welfare needs are. The Animal Welfare Act defines five needs. So very simply, these include the need for a suitable environment, a suitable diet, being able to perform normal behaviours, to be housed with or apart from other animals, depending on the social organisation of the species, and to be protected from pain, suffering, injury or disease. How do we translate this into practical action? The IUCN guidelines provide a lot more information on animal welfare considerations than I've included in this slide, but they can be summarised pretty well by this quote, simply that every effort should be made to reduce stress or suffering. This has been rephrased slightly in the code and guidance for England as conservation translocation should be designed to avoid stress, harm and mortality to translocated individuals. And in order to do that, we need to think carefully about where negative animal welfare might occur and what can cause poor animal welfare. And to do that, it's helpful to think systematically through the process of a translocation, which typically starts with the capture of an animal, which is kept for some period of time, transported somewhere else. It might then be kept again. And these two stages might repeat and also vary in length. So for an example, an animal might be trapped at a relatively small development site and released in a neighboring field, in which case the length of time that the animal is kept and the transport time would be very short. But for a release that requires either a quarantine period or some time in a pre-release enclosure, the holding period can be much longer and transport can hypothetically be across the country. The animal's then released and there's some period following the release where the survival of the animal might be monitored and the success of the project evaluated. Over the next few slides, I'm going to go through this process one stage at a time. What we need to do at every stage is to keep in mind the animal welfare needs, think of some of the problems that could arise and how they could be mitigated. So first of all, animal capture. This one's relatively easy because for most species in this country, there are established methods. And there are probably a limited number of methods that can be that are legally permitted. For some mammals, the types of traps that can be used, for instance, are subject to the Agreement on International Humane Trapping Standards, which were implemented in the UK in 2020. Things to think about whether the animal might be injured in the trap, whether it has shelter from either the sun or the cold. Does it have a hiding place? How frequently does the trap need to be checked? How, might, how long might the animal might be in the trap before it's checked? Does it need food? Is there a risk of separating dependent young from their mother? Bear in mind that these are wild animals and that some species and some individuals may be highly stressed in confined spaces, however comfortable you think that you've made it. Otters really don't like being trapped and deer and some birds are susceptible to capture myopathy, which is a degenerative muscle condition. It's brought on by extreme stress and physical exertion that can be fatal. A few years ago, we asked conservation practitioners about the animal welfare issues that they'd experienced. It was a really quick exercise with a very limited sample size, um, and it's something that we're trying to build on now, but the results do give some insight. So we had 38 respondents who had experience of conservation translocations. 42% reported they'd experienced animals that were distressed during capture. Capturing and moving wild animals is, of course, inherently stressful, and it would be really unrealistic to expect otherwise. But distress, when stress is particularly severe or prolonged or both, can have serious impacts on animal health and function, even when the animal is not physically injured. 32% of respondents also reported that they'd experienced animals being injured during trapping and capture, and 34% had experienced animals dying. So these are relatively common problems. Some of the considerations are the same when the animal is being kept. It's important to make sure that the animal has a suitable environment, including sufficient floor space and height to allow the animal to behave normally, has shelter and somewhere to hide. Is provided with a suitable diet, including sufficient clean water, is kept apart from animals. Again, um, as kept with or apart from other animals, again, dependent on what's appropriate for the species. And 34% of our survey respondents actually reported animal welfare issues associated with suffering due to confinement or crowding in captivity. And also that they're protected from disease. The aim should always be to keep wild animals in captivity for as short a time as possible although sometimes quarantine periods needed, sometimes that's a legal obligation, and there can be benefits to keeping the animals sometimes as well for a period before release to check that they're healthy or that they've recovered from being captured. Similarly, transport should always be planned to keep journey times to minimum. The animals must be fit to travel and they should be checked on during the journey. The welfare needs of the animal are as important during travel as they are while the animal's being kept, 
This includes sufficient and safe space, ability to rest and provision of food and water. Tranquilizers might be needed for some species. In our survey of conservation practitioners, 42% of respondents reported that they'd experienced animals that were distressed during transport. So things about to think about at the release site include the environment that the animals released into, the availability of food and resting or denning sites, the time of year that the animals released um, in terms of the animal's life cycle and the conditions at the time. It's better, for instance, to release an animal at a time when there are plenty of resources available so that the animal has time to establish and learn about its new environment before refined, finding resources becomes more challenging. It's important to know your species and to know your site to be able to identify potential threats to the survival and welfare of the animal and to be able to avoid or mitigate them. In our survey, 45% of respondents experienced animal mortality due to unknown or inadequately mitigated threats at the release site. So obviously these are all things that can be thought of beforehand. A soft release strategy can sometimes be beneficial. This involves providing some sort of housing, food or support to translocated animals while they establish at the release sites. This is a technique that's often used to increase site fidelity, but might also provide animal welfare benefits by allowing animals to locate natural resources in their own time by minimizing any suffering that would be experienced by individuals that are unable to immediately locate resources, find their, find their own way around the new site. One aspect that I think is often neglected, particularly in terms of animal welfare, is considering what animals are already established at the release site. Predation and competition are both natural processes in the world and something obviously that humans shouldn't intervene in under normal circumstances. But when we're moving animals from one place to another, whether we're doing that for our own purposes, such as being legally required to do so, or for the animal's benefit because we want to prevent it from being killed, we want to give the animal the best possible chance of survival, the lowest possible chance of suffering. So with this in mind, it would probably not be the best strategy, strategy for instance, to release a hedgehog next to a badger set. This is particularly important for territorial species. Releasing an animal, perhaps unknowingly, into the territory of an established animal is really likely to have negative welfare impacts for either the released animal or the territory holder, depending on which animal is the toughest. Animal welfare issues experienced post-release are most often associated with declining physical health of the released animals due to either declining body condition or increased physical injuries or mortality in the first few weeks post-release. These things can often be mitigated or at least improved on in future projects by changing some aspect of the way that the animals are treated before release uh, and where and how they're released. But the key point here is that you need to monitor how the animals are doing. Otherwise you won't know and you won't be able to do anything. And obviously this is a point that various other speakers have, have raised. As well as monitoring survival, monitoring the behavior and the health of translocated animals can give an indication of how well they're establishing after translocation and an early warning of potential animal welfare problems. Again, the wider ecosystem and the other species present at the release site are also important, and you should also consider the potential for the animals that you're releasing to negatively impact the welfare of other species, either directly, such as through predation or competition, or indirectly due to, for example, habitat changes. So the previous slides were all based on ideas of best practice, how best to care for individual animals. And that is the first step, but we should also be aware of trade-offs. Actions can have costs as well as benefits. So whilst a soft release, for example, might have the benefit of protecting an animal in the early stages of a release, can also increase dependence and mean that the animal is less well able to cope on its own. Similarly, providing supplemental food ensures that the animal has the right kind of diet and will be able to find sufficient food but it might also cause stress associated with people constantly accessing the site. This photo shows a burrowing owl equipped with a satellite transmitter, which is really useful for tracking the behavior and the fate of the animal. It can provide all kinds of useful information that informs improvements in release methods that might increase survival and improve welfare impact outcomes for individual animals, but it also has costs for the animal associated with the handling required and having to carry the extra weight and size of the tag. Radio tracking is just one example, but what all tracking devices and direct monitoring methods have in common is the need for repeated capturing and handling of the animals, which might cause stress and affect the animal's ability to adapt um, or their susceptibility to disease or ability to reproduce. So whether or not we carry out a specific action should be based on the balance of these benefits and costs. And of course, John Ewan um, touched on this as well, and we've been thinking with him um, in previous, in previous work about how we bring animal welfare into that decision-making process as well. But the important point is, is it's, okay, the important point here is it's not always possible to optimize animal welfare. 
but it should be part of the decision making process. This then becomes an iterative process whereby the actions themselves and our knowledge of the relative strengths and benefits are continually improved with new information, new methods and new technologies. So throughout, it's important to plan, to adapt and to continually evaluate what you're doing and how the animals are reacting. These photos show riverside enclosures that are used to house waterfalls before they're released. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this process. The idea is that the waterfalls dig themselves out and so they have time to adapt to their new surroundings. These enclosures work, but they might not have done. And if they hadn't worked, evaluation would have been needed to be aware of that and a backup plan in place to mitigate the problem. To ensure that problems can be dealt with quickly, and this of course is really important when we're thinking about animals suffering in the wild, we need to think through the possible problems that might occur before they do and to have alternative plans in mind. Uh, Lauren, I'm just giving you, sorry, five minute warning. Okay, Thanks. I'm almost there. Thanks. Finally, to honestly minimize animal suffering, there needs to be an exit strategy. When is enough enough? There should be clear protocols ahead of time for dealing with injuries, including veterinary assistance, and when it should be provided and when not, and other issues such as animals not feeding properly. Think about, for example, at what point would be appropriate to intervene. If released animals are clearly suffering and there appears no way to mitigate it, then removing it from the wild might be the only option. The only humane option. It's not easy to identify when we reach that point, but it's important to think about it and to be clear in your planning process that, that it is an option. So moving forward, we really urge practitioners to communicate, to improve the methods used and in terms of how they impact animal welfare, we need open, honest and critical assessment of the issue. And this is something that Sarah also stressed this morning more generally. For welfare, these things, they're not difficult conceptually. It's about caring for the animals and recognizing perhaps that not all suffering will be obvious, but the practicalities can be seriously challenging. So we really encourage you to share your experiences and probably most importantly, to share your bad experiences and collectively think about how practices can be improved and whenever possible, perhaps go beyond what is re required by the law where you can. So finally, and this is my last slide, so to summarize, where could negative animal welfare occur? Well, simply the short answer is every single stage of the process from, you, from when you first trap and pick up that animal to when you release it and for some time afterwards, arguably until it's uh, established and surviving and doing well, animal welfare, negative animal welfare can occur. What could potentially cause animal welfare? Again, many things. These might include poorly designed traps, neglect during holding or transport, aggression from other animals, absence of resources at the release side, proximity to humans, to name just a few. How can animal welfare be maximized? It's about ensuring that the basic physiological, ecological, and behavioral needs of the animals are met. Even when issues arise, they can often be mitigated by making changes to the methods. Examples are reducing animal holding time, changing the type, timing or duration of transport, or the release method methodology, changing the marking or tagging devices used, using less invasive methods, advanced technology, and ensuring that devices are fitted by experienced staff members. And the list goes on really. Um, key to this is a thorough understanding of the biology of the animals being translocated, including their specific dietary, ecological, social, and behavioral requirements. At all stages where animal handling or direct interference with the animals is required, <coughs> excuse me, the methods used for restraint, transport, handling, biological sampling, and animal identification should be humane and carried out as quickly as possible, with minimal human contact wherever possible. Um, Non-invasive methods should be considered. So that's really it from me. I'd just like to thank the, the organisers for inviting me to be part of this, particularly Martin for spearheading much of the, um, this work in the UK. And I should say that most of what I've been talking about today, including the survey that I mentioned, is taken from a book chapter that I wrote with Axel, published in the Conservation Translocation book that others have mentioned. So this is very much a joint effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. That was, <coughs> um, that was fascinating and, yeah, really useful to consider the, the trade-offs and um, all the considerations that are needed. Um, you've got You've caught us up with one minute, but I think we'll save questions until the end. So just a reminder to all delegates, if you please put your um, questions in the chat. And we are moving over now to David Bavan, who's going to talk to us about the soci socio-economic and cultural considerations. Um, so I'll just introduce you whilst you share your first slide, David. Um, David is an interdisciplinary conservation scientist and facilitator combining training and experience in zoology, ecology, and the social science, sciences. 
David has a particular interest in conservation translocations, restoration ecology, managing environmental conflicts and eco-democracy. He currently works as a postdoc researcher on the X Cases team in the Renew project, which is a partnership between the University of Exeter and National Trust that takes a people in nature approach towards biodiversity renewal. So thanks, David, and over to you. Thanks, Nita. Um, yeah, thanks all. Nice to join you this afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you a bit about, yes, yeah, socio-cultural considerations for conservation translocations. And whilst some of it might not be absolutely specific to de developmental um, mitigatory translocations, I think there's going to be some broad take-homes which are hopefully applicable across the board. Um, I'm going to draw on <clears throat> yeah, my experience as a practitioner and a researcher, so working on uh, translocation projects for pine martins, um, Eurasian lynx up in Scotland, and uh, work that I've done in Wales around conflicts with rewilding, um, and also some of the stuff that I've been doing with uh, wildcats up in Scotland. And <clears throat> I do have a slight bias uh, in this presentation towards carnivorous vertebrates or carnivores, um, because I think that um, I suppose there's a hierarchy of complexity associated with cons with translocations. And by thinking about, in this case, some of the more complex cases, I think there's probably a lot of lessons nested within those which are applicable across different taxa and different contexts. Um, but basically, the, the complexities of translocations, they, they are as much socio-cultural as they are biological in origin. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they, they remain quite risky and high-cost endeavours. You know, they can... Um, they're certainly not guaranteed to succeed. And I think people often underestimate the costs involved in, in the long-term commitment towards these, these projects. And this is mainly because, um, you know, there's there's a number of dynamic and interacting complexities, but which are basically associated with the kind of changing nature of human communities, landscapes, and ecosystems resulting from our activity and the way we manage the land, um, ecological change and climate change. This makes quite a dynamic mix of consistently changing variables which we have to work in. And the sustainability of these projects is often contingent on the acceptance and tolerance um, by the people who have to experience daily coexistence with the kind of species that we're working with. And, you know, direct and indirect competition for resources between people and wildlife, this, this frequently leads to situations where coexistence is strained. Um, and this is a, this is a prominent source of, of conflict within conservation and and it raises questions of equity around the kind of work that we do um and there are many stakeholders that often challenge the kind of work we do based on ethical grounds because because these are human endeavors and it comes down often to a priority and a decision made by one group um and then a seeking to realize that priority and so as, as a result of this you know the science supporting translocations is increasingly and i think necessarily multidisciplinary um which I'll go on to, to, to expand on why we should embrace that. But a lot of these, a lot of, a lot of this is based around fear and risk and uncertainty. You know, we're dealing with species which have maybe been had had a period of absence um, or for which there's no knowledge of coexistence or familiarity. And so the kind of deep seated fear associated with unfamiliar threat and you know people's perception of exposure to harm to themselves or to their livelihoods, especially when it's perceived to be imposed by an external agency. You know, these are major components of conflicts between people over wildlife, and then ultimately, or concurrently, between people and the wildlife themselves. And this can be exacerbated by lack of knowledge, um, unfamiliarity, no experience of living alongside unfamiliar species, um, the consequence of shifting baseline syndrome, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, whereby, you know, over time, um, in, in absence of experience, um, we lose adaptive behaviours to, to coexist with some of these species. And it can work the other way. So shifting baselines can also work the other way, whereby if, if a species recovers and becomes more abundant, then um, suddenly there's the perception that they're overabundant and there's more than there's ever been because people are used to a very low baseline. And so different stakeholders, they will perceive and quantify risk in very different ways. So um, as an example, if we if we think about um, something like Lynx, which, have been, which we've, we've been doing work on in Scotland, then um, uh, people with an empirical scientific background will look at the risk of Lynx to the sheep flock of Scotland as a whole, and they will judge it to be negligible. But, you know, they might say there'd be 0.01% of the sheep flock will be killed by Lynx per year. But if you're a sheep farmer, 
and that flock is your livelihood, then one sheep is too many. And so they 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 quantify risk in very different ways, and this can lead to conflict um, over those kind of assessments. And fear is layered. You know, it doesn't it doesn't exist in isolation of wider factors and phenomena. Um, you know, it, there's all sorts of background socioeconomic considerations which feed into people's perception of risk and so for example in the farming community it might be the risks of brexit the changing state of play with farming and agriculture society's priorities around food production um, all creating a an uncertain um, context in which something like a translocation then comes in and adds another layer of uncertainty so, and the assessment of risk, this can change based on um, how perceived, the perceived integrity and trustworthiness of the practitioners themselves. It kind of does matter in a lot of cases who is doing the translocation and their perceived credibility and their track record um, in terms of how people then assess risk and um, trustworthiness. And the roots of this run quite deep. So the, my, my, the take home from all the work I've done um, is that a lot of this comes down to people's values. And in particular, the fact that the social context in which translocations are taking place is, is changing and has been changing for, for a number of years now. So translocation projects can therefore become, they can become the focal point for expressions of existing grievances or, or, may, or clashes of ideology based around different kinds of prioritization over land use, over um, how one relates to nature and the environment. So at the moment, we're, we're kind of in the middle of we're seeing ongoing change in societal and environmental values in, in West industrialized countries, which is generally characterized by a broad shift from quite an anthropocentric utilitarian value base, which is nature for us. You know, nature's there, we exploit it, we use it for resources, we manage it closely towards something which is much more ecocentric and mutualistic. So it's nature and us, you know, nature exists alongside us and we look and we look after nature and in return, nature looks after us. And this, this shift along this kind of spectrum is creating, I suppose, a disputed space in the middle where these values are colliding um, and conflict over the management of land and nature is being played out in this, in this space in the middle, this contested space. Um, and this could be characterized, for example, by um, traditional land uses versus maybe rewilding, concepts of rewilding, um, you know, the um, clashes over whether to control and manage or whether to release and let be. Um, you know, these this is this is quite a classic, um, I suppose, area of conflict within which translocations and um, wildlife recovery sits bang in the middle. And loss of control in this context is a recurring theme in narratives that oppose translocations. The idea of um, a, a species being returned by human agency, which will probably have legal protection and which will therefore be outside of people's remit to be able to control and manage and be able to actively control the risk that is perceived. So, for example, with something like the links, you know, supporters um, broadly for the rest the restoration of links as a top priority is linked to and symbolic of aspirations for the reduced human control of nature in favour of restoring natural processes. But for other stakeholders, this kind of bringing of wilderness as symbolized by something like the links, this is perceived as an ex existential threat to their livelihoods and their culture and their history and the work of their ancestors in bringing that history to bear. So, and I've seen, and we, and I think and I've seen this across most of the contexts in which I worked, whether it's rewilding, whether it's carnival reintroduction, um, you know, whether it's other types of decision-making around land use is that when we looked at it with Pine Martins, for example, we found um, we, a number of perspectives that were characterized that, that, that characterized a response to Pine Martin translocation. Um, and at one end, you had this concerned managerial opinion um, and the other, an environmental protectionist opinion. And this same or a similar pattern was revealed when we investigated this, the social feasibility of links reintroduction. We found at one end, there's a very strong voice in opposition, which is absolutely no to links. And at the other end, it's very much about links for change because links would be part of the kind of necessary environmental rehabilitation, which is required in terms of trophic, the re-establishment of trophic processes. But in the middle of all this, you obviously have a lot of other voices, um, which, which, which vary along that spectrum. But broadly, the kind of main areas of publicized conflict occur between these 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 divergent ends of a value spectrum and obviously in the middle you know then you've got um differences around people's 
livelihoods, their sense of identity, um, where their knowledge comes from, which kind of knowledge they prioritize. Um, you know, whether you whether you derive your information and you base your assumptions empirically in science and whether you 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 lean towards peer-reviewed literature to get your information or whether actually you don't trust that and you think that that doesn't have any relevance to you and actually what's more important is what is experienced on the ground and the lived embodied knowledge of people who have to coexist with these species and then relationships and trust trust is a big one and um, trust can be undermined very very easily and takes a long time to build back up um, historical experience. I think conservation has um, is perhaps not been as good as it could have been in um, taking the social elements and feasibility of the of translocations into account, um, and, and and that's led to, to I suppose smouldering enmity and unresolved conflict um, across a number of different projects and scenarios, which which informs people's perception of um, upcoming translocations or proposals for translocations. And power. A lot of people feel marginalised and disempowered, um, particularly people who with rural livelihoods. Um, and I suppose conservationists and scientific institutions can be seen to be powerful and to be and to be using these kind of projects as an exertion of their power and of their values and worldviews and priorities over people who feel they might be marginalised and don't have a voice to to be heard or to oppose these kind of initiatives or to contribute even. So in terms of navigating this, um, yeah, so historically, I mean, we've kind of treated the social feasibility as a bolt on and we kind of, and I think we've probably failed to acknowledge, engage and then respond to some of the deeper social and psychological dynamics between groups and individuals in relation to nature and wildlife. Um, so in order to kind of authentically explore the social, the socio-cultural and economic aspects, um, it's kind of, it's fundamental to design a socially just and democratic or democratically legitimate initiatives. We should interbrace in, or embrace um, interdisciplinary teams um, and multi-group stakeholder collaborations. I think, um, you know, gone are the days, I think, where ecologists can solely manage a translocation effectively. I think um, I think we need to kind of embrace a broader discipline of science um, and even across the arts and cultural sectors to, to, to who have a better understanding um of how, how people work sometimes and how some of this stuff comes together and we can try and mitigate some of the perceptions of hidden agenda and, and power by broadening out collaboration across different groups of stakeholders and embracing stakeholders with different views to come together and um, and constructively collaborate towards exploring and towards um, negotiating and finding consensuses and working through some of the emerging conflicts and when it comes to like consultation, it's it's only consult it's only consultation if contributors actually have the agency to affect an outcome, um, and so one of the a consistent I suppose gripe is that these things tend to be a foregone conclusion. A decision is made, and it will just get iteratively shoehorned through, and over time this just leads to disenfranchisement and rebellion of certain stakeholders, and ultimately it will turn into conflict, um, which can manifest in in the the killing. Of the very species which we're seeking to to protect and restore and so yeah it's not really sufficient just to do kind of a like survey online and then report that 90 percent of respondents or you know the british public want wolves back for example um, i think that smacks of some other populist approaches which um, might be quite prominent in the headlines at the moment and so you know the kind of days where where it was thought sufficient to do that just to run an online survey and say yep done got it you know those 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 are gone i think and um and the legitimacy of those is is rightly questionable so i think we need to start adopting more deliberative participatory processes particularly with an emphasis on building trust between stakeholders who are in oppositional positions um and what's important in these is is integrity and transparency in the process um and we can adopt mixed methods. So there's, there's methods like Q method, which we've used um, when I was with Vincent Wildlife Trust and with the National Trust now. Mixed methods approaches, which can lend um, academic rigor to the exploration of people's views and the feasibility, um, whilst at the same time producing quite intuitive outputs, which people can understand. And people like Q method because it's qualitative, so you get good, rich data, but it also has a quantitative underpinning, which decision makers like. They like to have some statistical rigor. So we can use mixed methods approaches to really add um, some, 
credibility to our assessments now and we need to be but we need to be realistic about time scales so um obviously it's gonna be different different species but we i think we have to start acknowledging that you can't just designate six months or a year for example to undertaking a process to explore this kind of thing and then think at the end that you'll have a green light or a situation which is resolved these things take time because people take time and values are ingrained quite a lot of time and are hard to shift um i'm going to skip this one i think well what i was going to highlight here basically was that we we, we did quite well in scotland building up trust with um stakeholders who were who at the time were feeling quite a lot of animosity towards the idea of links to introduction and i think one of the ways that we did this is that we were not we we, we were employed by the links to scotland partnership to investigate social feasibility and we did this relatively objectively it wasn't us that were driving the project and i think the key thing we built trust in the process was that we were not we did not have an agenda of trying to reintroduce links that was not our objective our objective was to reflect um what people thought about it um, and that was valued. Um, and the other thing is that people want to be engaged. People want information and they want to know. And they're very, very, people aren't stupid. They'll be easily hoodwinked if you turn up and provide a load of tropes or cherry pick evidence. You know, it's important to, to give a, a, an objective view of the evidence, which is accessible to people and is well sourced. Um, David, but, sorry, five minutes. Yeah, no problem. Thank so you. in terms of the challenges, I think the major challenges we've got is we need to seek parity in our assessments between utilitarian and intrinsic considerations, because currently we bias them towards economic costs, which we need to rebalance. We need to think about, or the challenge is who decides. So we need to balance the interests of local communities who experience the impacts versus wider societal ambitions and objectives, because the public broadly support translocations, or they, but that's not often reflected on the ground. Uh, we need to think more carefully about long-term responsibility for managing coexistence, the financial implications and the responsibilities over who does this. Um, the perceived need for control and exit strategy is a hard one. So people often ask for reversibility, but is this even feasible once you get the stage of releasing, for example, uh, 20 wildcats into the Cairngorms? We need to be better about thinking about the voice of future generations and thinking about this in the long term and we need to be better at representing the voice and the rights of nature in these conversations i think these are two stakeholders which are very underpowered so in terms of some key principles um it's obviously going to be you know some of this is going to be less or more appropriate based on species and the aim of these things is not to force things through to a predetermined end goal but nor do we want to create indefinite delays and endless filibustering around these these processes and that's where um really effective facilitatory support is is invaluable so in terms of some future approaches i think could be informative i think um principles of eco-democracy so looking at approaches that are based on equity could be really useful so this is where you know groups and communities using decision making systems that respect the principles of human democracy whilst explicitly extending valuation to include the intrinsic value of non-human nature with the ultimate goal of evaluating human wants equally to those of other species and the living systems that make up the ecosphere. So this would be a way maybe that we could start to find parity between some of these material considerations of translocations, material impacts, and um, some of the more um, intrinsic value that people have, which are at the moment underrepresented or disempowered in these conversations. And so we have examples like the Living Parliament or the Parliament of Things, where these kind of conversations could be structured or maybe adapted citizens' assemblies. Um, and it's important to integrate all of this. So social ecological systems approaches, um, so you know the socio-cultural, economic, ecological, biological factors, these all intersect and shouldn't be treated in isolation. Um, and maybe we could think about, and this is something we're doing at the moment, actually, or something totally different around dogs, actually, and deer management. It's thinking about a, an adapted one health approach which coalesces social and ecological considerations around a central premise of health equity and resilience for people, wildlife, populations, habitats, and ecosystems across generations. And I wonder if this could rebalance some of the current bias towards material considerations and maybe broaden our collective understanding of, of community. So we start to think beyond silos, beyond silos and beyond human community to start thinking about broader collective communities of living things and the needs of those things um, in relation to resilience and to prospering. Um, and I think that might provide us a way that we can start to, to marry some of these ecological and social considerations into something which is cohesive and something which we can relate to because it's about resilience and health and well-being. Um, um, and this is to be left. Sorry. 
Yeah, no worries. I say, and and this is something I would I'd love to explore more. And we, as I said we're doing it in different contexts at the moment around um, questions around rights of nature um, in relation to yeah interactions between people, their pets, and the environment, uh, deer management. And yeah, I'd love to be able to consider or or, or pursue some of these in um in a in a broader context to do translocations. But they are ambitious, and I think that's another challenge we face is that. Um, we need to we need to be more ambitious in the way that we do these and we need to see these 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 processes which are participatory and embrace new ideas not as ways to stall a conversation or to provide opportunities to endlessly endlessly kick the ball into the long grass but as opportunities to do something which could lead to much more sustainable equitable outcomes in the long term um and that's that's what i've got so contact me if you like for more information on any of that stuff um because we've got some published papers and some other bits and bobs and uh yeah lots of information going so thanks Fantastic. thanks so much david um that was really interesting and useful and i'm sure um either cie or we will be in touch with um with the um any links or um and and the recording as well so Lovely. OK, and we are moving on to our last talk of the day. So I'd like to welcome back Martin Gaywood, um, who's going to talk about carrying out conservation translocations in Britain and the recommendations and legal requirements. So moving over to you, Martin, you, I can see your slides, but you're not sharing at full screen yet. And I can't hear you. Are you OK, there? that's that. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. OK, over to you, Martin. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much, and, and thanks everybody for hanging on this long. I'm making it to the end. This is the last talk. It's fairly short and sweet uh, and succinct to uh, talk about the legal issues and recommendations surrounding conservation translocations. And again, as I mentioned before, I work for Nature Scott, uh, and so Gemma Harding at Natural England uh, has very much assisted with this talk and giving the, an English perspective. So very briefly, uh, talk a bit about the recommendation side of things, the guidelines and the codes. And then we'll get on to some legislation and the licensing. The guidelines for the reintroductions goes back to the late 90s. Uh, 1998 was when the first version was produced, uh, coming out of, I suppose, a, a range of experiences, good and bad, in terms of the increasing numbers of reintroduction projects going on. And uh, these guidelines formed a, a, a framework of action for, for many years. These were revised in 2013. Um, extended to include not just reintroductions, but the other sorts of conservation translocations that I was describing this morning, you know, reinforcements, assisted colonizations, and ecological replacements. Um, at this, this change from uh, thinking just around reintroductions to wider conservation translocation has been reflected in, in the IUCN specialist group concerns. So they've actually renamed themselves from the reintroduction specialist group to more recently that the conservation translocation specialist group. So it, it has this wider perspective because the same basic principles apply to all these forms of uh, conservation translocation. So how are they actually applied here in Britain? Um, again, starting with the Scottish approach because that's what I know about most of all. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, the National Species Reintroduction Forum. Um, and uh, we've got this, this forum is made up of about uh, 30 member organizations. It's chaired by Nature Scott, and it considers various sorts of strategic issues linked around reintroductions and other sorts of conservation translocations. An important element of it all is that it recognizes multiple uses of the countryside. So it has conservation NGOs, uh, uh, land manager organizations, public bodies, and so on. Uh, one of the earlier things it did was to produce the Scottish code. So. As I mentioned before, the code itself is very much based on the AIUCN guidelines, but it's, it uses um, Scottish legal elements and Scottish policy and Scottish practical aspects built into the way we've designed the Scottish code. And it, because it was owned by the for, uh, produced by the forum, it's therefore got this wide ownership, which is quite an important element of this. Um, it was given a ministerial launch, so it has government approval, and uh, it was a, a world first at, it, at the time. You can get the, the code uh, by, uh, at the Nature Scott website uh, where we host it on behalf of the forum. Um, it provides a fair bit of detail. It walks practitioners through the process. I'm not going to go into great detail on this. Um, suffice to say, these are the main bullet points of what it covers. You know, it goes from everything to uh, starting with whether 
conservation translocation is indeed the right approach when you're dealing with a particular situation. Are there other alternative, better methods to use? Thinking about all the biological considerations, the risks and the potential benefits that and the opportunities that might come up those processes, the social, economic, social, cultural side of things. Um, thinking about the monitoring, uh, thinking about how you then report on what you've learned from the experience and sharing it with the wider community and so on. In England, there is also the code. Uh, this was produced in 2021 uh, by DEFRA. Um, and uh, it, again, very much aligned with the IECN guidelines and, and not and therefore, of course, therefore not dissimilar from the Scottish code as well. And, and indeed, uh, we in Scotland worked with our English colleagues uh, with, during the production of, of the English code. So it's non-statutory. Uh, there's many aspects of the conservation translocation which are covered by legislation. And, and Natural England have a, have a key statutory role there in overseeing a lot of that regulatory side of things. And you can uh, look at the, the English code at the gov.uk website if you do a simple search there for the, for the code. Um, again, they also have a summary of what's included in the code. And again, it's, it's very similar uh, to, to what's in the Scottish version, you know, starting with what are there alternatives, thinking about the biological considerations, the socioeconomic uh, considerations, looking at the risks, the opportunities, how to mitigate risks and so on. And again, the monitoring and sharing information at the end of it. Uh, there is uh, a sort of equivalent to the National Species Reintroduction Forum in England, and that's called the English Species Reintroduction Task Force, which was Sarah described this morning. That was formed in 2023, and it's chaired by Andy Clements. He was appointed by DEFRA. And it's made up of 15 members, works slightly different to the Scottish model, and it's made up of a range of experts from a, a number of different disciplines, and they provide evidence-led advice and guidance on, on various sorts of conservation translocation activities going on in England. And there I their real objective is to make sure that um, everything and everyone gets full benefit from species conservation translocations going on uh, in England for, you know, for, nature, reco for nature recovery and indeed wider society. Um, in, in Wales, it's Natural Resource Wales who, who have the role of assessing projects. Uh, and they again, they very much apply the IUCN guidelines. They're actually working on their own Welsh code at the very at the moment, in fact, and they're hoping that this will be published uh, later this year. So basically, in summary, we've got these codes and, and they provide details on the range of biological and socioeconomic and legal issues to consider as you go through these processes. Um, so these codes, together with the IUCN guidelines, they provide this best practice approach. So we basically recommend that this approach is used for all conservation translocations. You know, no matter where they are and when they are, etc. You know, always try and use them when you can, uh, and that includes mitigation translocations, uh, and that applies to Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland. But that's obviously that's especially the case where the species licensing uh, applies. So getting down to the some of the legal aspects of this and where that side of things comes in, uh, and again starting on the Scottish side. Um, so in Scotland, we do have a slightly different situation here than we do um, in other parts of, of Britain. Um, there's two sorts of licenses you might need when you're doing a release in Scotland, protected species licenses and or uh, what we call non-native species licenses. It's those latter ones which are a bit more complicated and I'm probably not going to be able to go into great detail here to explain them. But basically, in essence, what in Scotland, we have legislation which um, where there's a presumption against releasing or planting out species outside their native range. And native range is actually a legal term that we use in Scotland. In essence, what it means that is that if a species um, uh, becomes extant in a particular area, region or nationally, um, then to return that species, to re reintroduce that species, you always need a non-native species license. Um, in essence, what this really means is that all reintroductions of whatever scale, national down to local, need uh, one of these licenses. Or reintroductions might need a license, depending on the species concerned. Basically, if in doubt, just contact Nat uh, Nature Scott and, and we will help uh, provide advice on, on the situation. Uh, we have a project form, which is sort of based on the code. And the idea uh, is that it helps to walk the practitioner through the whole process to make them think about all the considerations and issues 
it's a sort of risk-based approach they use as well. It, the idea is it helps the practitioner identify the high risk activities where they need to put most thought and effort. Uh, and it also serves as a license application as well. So you don't have to sort of do all this paperwork twice, but it is there to actually help the practitioner do a more, uh, to increase the likelihood of a successful project. Um, one little thing, which probably isn't going to be so relevant to mitigation translocations, but in Scotland, um, we don't uh, license releases into enclosures. Uh, there are these enclosures around Britain these days, which might be more semi-natural. And in Scotland, we don't, we don't do that. In England, uh, the situation is a wee bit different. Um, they're uh, only species that are no longer established, uh, resident species or, or their regular visitors, or that they're, they're protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act require license to be released into the wild. They have a scoping form, it's not mandatory, um, and, and compliance with the code is not mandatory, um, and it, but it can only be secured where a license is required. Uh, there, in terms of the, the the use of enclosures, uh, it's, it's quite possible that in some situations you do need a license to release uh, some uh, former native or native species into um, into enclosures. So um, again, there's a slight difference there between the English and Welsh situation. Um, so how does this apply? Uh, how does it all relate to mitigation translocations in general? Well, as I mentioned before my introductory talk, you know, mitigation translocations fall within this wider sort of umbrella family, I suppose, of what of conservation translocation. So basically, you know, they do apply. Um, so the codes are relevant. Um, and, and again, in all situations, we always recommend their use because it's just best practice that we all want to try and get as a good a biodiversity gain at the end of the day as possible. And the aim of these codes is to actually help the practitioner achieve those aims. Um, we, having said all that, um, as I mentioned before, certainly it's best to try and avoid the need for mitigation translocation in the first place. You know, it does tend to be really more of a last resort type activity. Um, nevertheless, you know, when they do happen, uh, the aim should be to try and deliver a net gain for biodiversity, uh, of course. Um, and the sort of things we've been discussing today in the web now, all the various considerations, whether it's welfare, biosecurity, genetics, whatever, these are all issues where there's enormous amounts of information now which are available to us and will help us um, achieve a good conservation aim. Um, of course, there are wider good practice principles associated with development. And when we've been talking about conservation translocations today, of course, there's all sorts of other environmental considerations as well. And that sort of advice, which we're not covering in the webinar today, you can get it on the, uh, the websites of uh, CIEM, but also the, the statutory nature conservation organizations. Um, finally, it's just to let you know that you know some of these issues, they are complex and certainly getting your head around some of the legal aspects uh, can be a little bit confusing. So basically, if in doubt or uncertain, simply contact uh, the relevant uh, statutory nature conservation organisation and they should be able to advise. Um, there are the key emails to contact. As I, I think this, this uh, is being recorded, so hopefully you'll have access to this at the end and one way or another we make sure that they're made available to all of you. That's it, thanks very much. And thanks also to Delphine, Liz and Declan and the other agencies uh, who've provided some advice for this presentation. Thanks, Martin um, and, and Gemma and your other contributors. That was, that was really useful. Um, so um, thanks to all the speakers and I'd like to invite them to turn on their screens um, and join us for the Q&A session. And you've, given us an extra seven minutes for that as well. Thank you, Martin. That's great. So we've been getting various questions in the chat. Um, some are for specific speakers and then we've got some general questions as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get through the majority of them. Um, when everyone's here and back, I'll start, I'll start going through. Feel free as well to drop more questions in the Q&A if you have them. Um, but I'll, Martin, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a break for a second and um, um, I'll ask Richard um, a question that we've had for you, which is based on your experience working with consultancies, what do you think is the main obstacle to effective monitoring of mitigation translocations? And if the main challenge is related to regulatory policy changes, 
What do you think are the primary obstacles to achieving these changes to necess necessitate more rigorous monitoring for translocations? Uh, I, I think it's complex. I think there are multiple barriers. Um, just to relate experiences that we've run from workshops uh, over the years, we've run workshops associated with improving practice for consultants. And the feedback we've often had has been enormously diverse. Um, some consultants have the view, this is great. This will really improve how we do things. I'd like to know more. Um, how can we find out more? Um, often that gets bogged down because when they go back to their bosses, their bosses don't necessarily want to support it. Uh, at the other extreme, there are consultants that say, we just don't need to do this. And when you drill down into why you don't need to do this, they say, because it's, there's no statutory obligation to do this. So, and when you drill down further and say, well, what if it was a statutory obligation? They'll say, well, we're buying the expertise to do it. So there's, there's a very functional monetary driver there, I think. Um, and in terms of sort of supporting work, I mean, I think generally there's some of the bigger consultancies have supported some research, but generally um, most of the work that has gone on in, involving uh, mitigation translocations has, hasn't been driven by the consultancy sector. It's been driven by other drivers and, and, and other funders. So I think, I think there's a statutory element there in terms of improving the, the law and policy. I think there's a training and expertise element in there as well that needs so that that people have have the expertise to do it and and probably that will take time i think thanks very much richard um i don't know if anyone else wants to jump in with anything otherwise i will move on um to a question for matt um matt someone has asked is stress during transport a major contributory effect on disease development in plants and if so how can this be minimized i probably wouldn't characterize it as a major um effect but it's certainly a consideration and um the main way to kind of reduce stress i would say with plants is to move them during the dormant periods and um, that's you know yeah fortunately Plants are brilliant and they have lots of adaptations. And um, yeah, moving them during the dormant period is, is probably the best way to go. That's great. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, right, I have a question here for Aileen. Um, to get sufficient numbers for a conservation translocation, would it be more useful to have a joined up approach to mitigation translocations? i.e. species from many developments to go to the same site and developers pool their resources for monitoring and planning. Mm, interesting, yeah, that's um, a good one. I guess it depends on, if we're talking different species, it depends whether they can all grow in the same habitat. If it's in different... Aileen, sorry, just to jump in, your um, sound isn't great. I think it's better when you're closer. Thank you. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, it may also be my voice that is gone. <laughs> but... Um, it depends if it's different species. Um, it may depend on whether they can all grow in the same habitat. Um, so I don't know whether that was the question about different species. But then also for even if it was um, the same species and just adding up the numbers depends on how much habitat is available. It's the other problem. So for some of our rare species, even if we wanted to plant like thousands and thousands of them or could in the same location, then the habitat is just not available. Um, so the idea is great and it's a really, really valid point when it comes to the monitoring because it makes things so much easier when you have different things, different um, species or, or larger populations in one place. Um, but then there's also, final point, um, the question around whether it's better to have one large population or several small populations, um, which you know both, both are valid, um, but it's, it's, it depends. So it always all, all depends. Thank you for those thoughts on that, um, Aileen. Um, right, Martin, hopefully you've had a bit of a break now and I can ask you um, a question that's been posted for you. Um, wondering if mitigation translocations might be more widespread if there was greater awareness and protection afforded to taxa such as lichens and bryophytes, 
It seems if these are originating from development, then an imperative to take proactive actions is needed. I think the answer is uh, yes. So, I mean, I think that the two key terms there was awareness and protection. And inevitably, when it comes to the more cryptic species, such as the non vascular plants, invertebrates, and so on, for that matter, then inevitably, they are more critic and also we simply have less specialists able to um, identify and um, and to, to, to survey for these sort of species. So that that is one element. The awareness is clearly going to, is clearly an issue and a challenge, especially for some some of these taxonomic groups where we have extremely few taxonomic specialists and you know, literally a handful of lichenologists for some of these species. The second one, uh, yes, um, the protection element. So there's the issue of what people have to do legally and what it will be good if they did. And, you know, there's only a limited number of the non-vascular plants and invertebrates on the protected species list of one sort or another, whether European protected species or, or wildlife and classified act schedules. So again, you know, if they're protected, they're gonna inevitably gonna get more effort resources um, put into translocating them than if they're not. So I think the answer is yes. Um, as I mentioned before, obviously, if there's a legal, if there's le legal weight behind these things, obviously they've got to happen, and that's what the licensing process is meant to involve. But these guidelines, the IUCN ones under code, as I keep emphasising, they are also something we recommend all the time. I appreciate there's money involved uh, and issues and effort, but, and there are discussions there, I guess, for, for consultants amongst you between yourselves and your uh, the employing commercial organisations and so on, but. You know, I guess we're in this biodiversity crisis. If there are ways of encouraging and identifying the opportunities that exist where things can be done voluntarily, then you know, let, let's try and use it to the best of our ability. We've got the expertise, the guidance, and the know-how. Um, let's try and push these sort of activities as much as possible because um, you know, not everything is going to be fully protected, and so there will always be some 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 gaps. Thank you, Martin. So yeah, that's the Please, um, please spread the word. So we've, you know, got a good, good number of delegates here today. But if we can spread the word about the guidance and, um, especially in terms of mitigation translocation, then hopefully it will become just best practice, even if we can't change some of the legislation. Um, Lauren, um, I've got a couple of questions for you. So I'll just, I'll start with one. Um, uh, well, this is Lauren, and perhaps for the wider panel, your talk focused on the welfare of the individuals being trans translocated. Um, and you, of course, you touched on the welfare of animals already at the release site. What about considerations for the welfare of descendants of the translocated individuals, um, such as issues that might arise from limited carrying capacity or inbreeding? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really interesting one. Um, yes, because it's also it's something that we have talked about. Axel and I have written um, a paper quite a long time ago now, actually, and the recent um, book chapter. Uh, I suppose I don't really have a right answer, I guess, because um, it depends how long we think our obligation lasts. Obviously, legally, it only lasts while we're holding that animal, while we're restraining it. And then once it's released, probably under license, we don't have a legal obligation, an ethical obligation, a moral obligation, then perhaps we do. Um, and certainly we've, you know, you can think about things like um, you release animals and then they're going to be culled. They leave the release site and then they're going to be culled or something like that. To me, that seems wrong. Obviously, other people would have would have different views. So I, I don't really think at the moment there's a right answer. I'm sure other people have got views on that. Axel might have something that he wants to chip in because we've talked backwards and forwards about these kinds of topics. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a difficult one. But I do think that it would benefit from people thinking about that you know, don't go into this blindly. When we're putting animals there, we're putting them in a specific place. Um, and for the local communities involved as well, um, particularly when you're in other countries talking about big predators and things like that. Um, but yes, think about the future and think about um, is, um, yeah, the, is the population going to be viable and the welfare of exactly those, those animals as they live in that environment? Lovely. I'm not Absolutely. sure that that really provided an answer, but <laughs> I, I think that did. But I think um, David might have something to contribute as well. Thanks, David. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just because welfare is a, a tricky one because this comes up a lot of the time. So if we if we're thinking or if we're working particularly maybe with predatory species and we're thinking about welfare implications, then there'll be um, across that kind of spectrum of stakeholder interest in the project, they'll they'll ask about well, what about the welfare of the species which are predated and impacted by the translocated species? So what about the welfare of livestock? What about the welfare of other protected species for which there's also conservation imperative um and you can find it's quite easy to get into a place where you 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 find yourself prioritizing or asked to prioritize welfare which is an awkward place to be um and then the other and and lauren alluded to it as well is that um a lot of people who are not scientists perhaps or other stakeholders they, they will prioritize individual welfare whereas obviously we go in and we think about welfare maybe in a sense of a population and of, of, of the kind of um, the, the broader population health or the healthful community. And so welfare is a really tricky one because it, it's it's really layered and it really comes down to different people's prioritization over what and whose welfare should be prioritized. So there's just some, some awkward considerations and inherent in, in welfare. Great. Thanks for thanks for that, David. Um I've got a specific question for John and Bethany, I think John isn't here. So Bethany, can I ask you, um, when engaging with the community, in this case, the Maori, did you explain SDM as a process or did you just use it as a background framework? Yeah, so I was hoping John would be here to answer this um, because I wasn't involved in that particular project. Um, I can say, I can speak to it a little bit and just say that whenever we do these decision making workshops and projects, we do involve all the stakeholder groups including indigenous um, and local people so they will be involved in the process and have the process explained to them the language and the terminology used is something that you adapt depending on, depending on who you're talking to and who you have in the room so we might not use the exact terminology but that process as a whole is explained and everybody is a part of that process um, from the get-go so in, in our presentation we didn't really go into the method rather than just like the process in itself but yeah it's a lot of workshops a lot of in-person time a lot of discussion so and everyone's involved great thanks very much bethany um right i've got some general questions as well um someone has said what approach can consultants take to encourage clients to fund the aspects of translocations that from a mitigation perspective aren't legally required but from a conservation perspective a key I mean, we've touched on this, but if anyone's got any specific thoughts or suggestions, that would be great. And, and if, yes, Axel. Sure, I'll chime in and uh, yeah, thanks very much. I think it's it's very interesting, uh, you know, the legal context, like what is the legal thing to do? What is a desirable thing to do? You know, what, and how can one encourage best practice? And And I think that, while we think about things that seem irresponsible or sometimes outrageous or undesirable, we should turn our attention to what, what mechanisms can we um, have to applaud good practice and basically like to highlight those that are acting in a way that, that seems to be sort of above the norm or that, you know, is leading. So, I think one of the things is like it depends on the type of industry or the types of individuals, but uh, how much they might care about public profile. A lot of industry will be will have entire departments that are um, dedicated to preventing bad news, right? And uh, but they would be equally recipient of of uh, good news. So basically, you know, if a company goes above and beyond, if one were to applaud that in social media and scientific articles and, and the main media and say, hey, this is the kind of thing that we're looking for. I think it would make it easier for consultants to get their clients to fund more of the work and for more of that type of industry um, to, to then step up to the plate. If then other companies see others in their sector as being highlighted for good environmental practice, they might also be like, look, we want to be you know, in the good light, like our competitors. So it's just tough because in many cases you don't, like in terms of the carrot and the stick, sometimes the stick is pretty weak and the carrot isn't used enough. Um, so 
I just sort of encourage trying to be thoughtful about it. And I think in a lot of cases, it isn't an us and them conversation. You can have that conversation with the consultants, with different companies um, to ask them, what is it you care about? How can we make this better for you? You know, how can we make it sort of worthwhile for your shareholders to appreciate this kind of effort as well? Thanks very much, Axel. That's um, yeah, really important to consider what yeah, what mechanisms we can use to encourage best practice if if the legislation isn't there. Um, Gemma, um, I will pass over to you, and I'd just like to introduce you because you were the co-author on Martin's last talk. So Gemma Harding is senior officer for Species Reintroductions at Natural England. Thanks, Nida. Um, yeah, I'm probably speaking in my previous <laughs> hat as an ecologist, but just. Just an example of what Axel said of working is ecologist consultants can ask, you know, push push the best practice guidance and you won't always get it, but it's just getting that message out there. And even if you get pushback saying, well, we don't need to do this um, much detail at that standard, you can often get a compromise to get better things, sort of closer habitat um, sites where there's not existing populations just focusing on those key elements that are really important like welfare disease risk allowing species to be in nearby habitats so the population exists so i think there are ways to do it and ways to do it through through what lauren was talking about with the the welfare act and aspects like that but yeah i think if you don't ask you don't get so i think we we can push and it will make a change slowly Thanks very much, Gemma. Yeah, it sounds like we've got a, a to-do point um, followed, following up after this um, to come up with some thoughts. Um, Jim Foster, who I think is on the call, apparently has his hand up. I have to say, apologies, I can't see any hands. So if anyone else has, if someone can let me know. But Jim, if you have a question, would you like... I don't think you can turn your video on. Is that right? Or can you? If... but. Jim, if you'd like to put your question in the chat, then I can, oh, there, I can see, I can see yours. So it says, it seems to me that mitigation translocations are materially different to conservation translocations, as noted a few times today. Um, the drivers and intended outcomes, regulation and the context, etc., often don't overlap with conservation translocations. Um, do any of the panel know of anywhere in the world where there's been a sound reconciliation of the governance and guidance for these two types of translocation? Uh, any thoughts? I don't know again if, or we can bear that in mind and move on to another question if, if no one's sure off the top of their heads. Um, and in the meantime, I have got a question, Katie, for you, which is, do you have any examples of cases where a translocation has had an effect on human health? Um, yeah, so I think one of the best examples I can think of would be, you know, kind of large primate translocations and the risks, you know, from great apes, for example, um, from great apes to people and, and vice versa. So I think there's a good paper by is it Julie Sherman um, from a few years ago about great ape translocations and highlighting those risks. Yeah, so things like things like TB, um, you know, which is um, an important consideration for yeah for all kind of um, primates and also human health as well. So that's something that um, again, kind of going back to my point about disease risks from exit to environments, you know, it's something that, um, that, yeah, kind of primates are quite susceptible to in the captive environment and can be transmitted between, between species. Thanks very much, Katie. I think I'll bring in Martin next, if you've got a comment on that, and then David. It was just a quick one, really, in relation to that. I mean, there were the releases on Tayside and other parts of Britain, actually, of uh, Eurasian beaver. Uh, which is sort of unofficial releases, some of them are legal releases and so on. So, you know, there weren't really conservation translocations as defined, but nevertheless, there were releases. Uh, and with that one, it was um, uh, after some of these animals have been re released, um, a case of Echinococcus multiloculares, which is a tapeworm species, was discovered in a Bavarian beavers uh, in, in a zoo down in England. 
and it was suddenly became clear that the animals present that have been released illegally or uh, unofficially might have been carrying that parasite. There was a risk there. And indeed, what then subsequently happened was there had to be a fair bit of checking and trapping of, of these released animals to check they did not were not carrying this tapeworm. This tapeworm does not occur in Britain. It um, occurs in Europe. Um, it can be lethal to humans um, in, in some instances. So it clearly was a public health risk. I suppose the point I'm trying to make here is that um, obviously good, inevitably good, good biosecurity, good health, uh, disease risk assessments and so on is, is a core element of, of conservation translocation, including the public, public health element. Great. Thanks, Martin. David. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, that one. So, um, and I think it comes back again to that kind of point that I made about valuation, you know, in terms of like a, a materialistic valuation versus um, a sort of more intrinsic one. And um, so, yeah, we can think that there might be the potential for species to impact on public health through disease transmission, through uh, negative inter physical interactions. Um, but what, what I understand from my, from my experience anecdotally, and we'd have to, to dig into the literature, is that the there would be appreciative uh, mental health well-being benefits from having restored species back in those ecosystems for quite a significant number of people. Um, and it might work the other way in some cases as well. So obviously there might be negative psychological impacts for some particular, particular people. But I think we could probably have a better understanding, and I expect this might exist in the literature if we dig into it, around um, a, a broader lift to people's well-being in the presence of restored ecosystems with um, some of these species back in place. And I think that that could be quite appreciable. Thank you, David. Um, Katie, did you have something to follow up on that? Yeah, no, just to say that um, I think David, I really like David's points about kind of the One Health a one health kind of framework and I obviously would coming from my background but um yeah it was great to hear that that's kind of something you're thinking might be valuable and as you say I just agree about those kind of trade-offs between you know human kind of health and well-being and the disease risks so just one point which I've kind of been thinking about in the context of rewilding um so another kind of disease risk which I didn't have time to mention um is the idea that something like a beaver can be a kind of reservoir host for a, a pathogen of people like this tapeworm, a kind of coccus multilocularis. But there are other um, diseases as well, like tularemia, which is caused by a bacteria, which is, you know, um, something that humans are susceptible to as well. So the beaver and other species, for example, kind of wild boar and perhaps even, you know, deer, badgers, TB, you know, they can be introductions can also obviously, sorry, reintroductions or, or translocations can lead to you know, an increased um, population size or population density of that species. And then that, that can then mean that um, the kind of prevalence of that kind of infectious agent is increased in the environment. Um, so that's a kind of indirect way that um, translocation can also impact human health or kind of, you know, um, so it's another consideration. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Richard, you're on mute. Yeah, point. yeah. I mean, ju ju just an anecdote that might relate to this. Um, a few years ago, my university health and safety office called me because they we, we, we do full risk assessments for all field work and lab work. But they were concerned that we were handling lizards and whether that meant we had to do an assessment under the control of substances uh, hazardous to health because our occupational health officer had read something about lizard skin giving off particulate materials that can cause allergies. Um, I did look up the literature and it was extremely sketchy and very vague, and we ended up not having to go down that route. Um, but I think it, it raises a lot of issues over, over the values because we all live with cats and dogs with allergies. Pet dogs kill people on a regular basis and yet that's all part, we accept that as a society. Um, and when we look at sort of health risk assessments, uh, we're probably more, you're more likely to get a tapeworm from your pet dog than you are from a beaver. Um, but the, these sorts of issues don't seem to sort of come to the fore when we're looking at a lot of these health related issues, I think, contextualizing them and getting them in relation to our society's values more widely than the specific species and systems that we're looking at. 
Thanks, Richard. I can see we're coming close to the end of the question time. Katie, did you have something that you wanted to quickly say about disease before I have one more question? Yeah, sorry to chip in again, but just a flag for people working with herbs, um, something like salmonella, just like Richard's kind of explained, is, 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 a, is actually kind of one of the most common zoonotic, um, you know, um, infections. So just to flag that just basic hygiene, washing hands and stuff is obviously a really key precaution. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. I'm going to ask one more question, and I think that's it. Um, in relation to wildlife translocations, what are the influences that deter organisations from sharing unsuccessful or failed releases? Is it a fear of authority scrutiny or professional pride or competitive attitudes? Um, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, Katie and then Sarah. Or I think Sarah? Sarah? Yeah, no, I, didn't, I didn't have my hand up, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so I think the we, we thought about this with the, what I mentioned earlier, the Applied Ecology Resources platform, because we are encouraging people to publish, um, you know, robust, but not necessarily hugely sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, scientific investigation and things like that so it's very practice focused and we don't want to turn away any um, reports or studies of failed translocations because we think there's more learning to be had from failures than there are from successes in lots of respects so we have thought about this issue and I think it's a mixture of things I think part of it is a reticence to you know if there's a lot of public buy-in and investment you know if, if you're a, an NGO a charity for example you, you don't necessarily want to say, oh, gosh, but all that money that people donated doesn't seem to have worked because that's what sort of people want of the headline. There's also um, a scientific bias for publishing um, things that where you've shown things have worked and and, you, and people don't want to uh, publish sort of what they call negative results or failed, failed attempts. Um, and yeah, I think if there's things that are related to funding, you just want to, you well, you're forced to show that you're getting things right all the time. Um, so I think uh, a, a requirement to be sharing data, whatever the outcome, is really, really important. Um, and, and yeah, it can come from a mixture of things to answer the question. Um, Axel will probably chip in. Um, I've got to go because it's a school run, but thank you everybody for your time and, and thank attention. You. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thanks for your really fascinating talk earlier. Um, okay, Axel, yes, have you got um, something to contribute? Thank you. Yeah, just quickly again, um, success, uh, like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and so would uh, failure be as well. And so I, I think one of the issues as well is that um, proponents or ecologists themselves actually set the bar really high to try and get an idea across and to, you know, advocate for some sort of return of a species or whatever it is, whatever the ambition is. Um, but I think it's always important to, to stay true to how complex it is. I often say, you know, the reason why certain species has gone from a certain place um, or whatever the conservation need may be is that something's gone terribly wrong and it's complex and you know here we're taking an ambition there's uncertainties um but you know we think that we can work at this and it's going to take time um so basically being quite honest about it the the tricky thing about being honest about it is it's not as appealing sometimes to funders and to permit holders because you're saying what this isn't guaranteed but basically i've seen many situations where the conservationists themselves basically say if you give us some money, we're going to succeed at this, you know, and, uh, we, you know, we're very, very positive. So then when anything goes wrong and th things do go wrong, they get vilified. So if you can try to keep the bar lower, saying, hey, we're trying very hard, we are quite optimistic, it's going to take time, it's going to take resources, we're going to adaptively manage when we monitor and learn things, then it's harder to be sort of vilified for failure because you actually never sort of said you know, it's going to be that we have this many individuals on the landscape by this time. Um, so I think just uh, speak to the ambition, um, the process, the difficulty, some optimism, um, but don't sort of in the media or with funders or with permitting agencies uh, over-exaggerate the, the likelihood of 
achieving whatever it is you, you want to achieve. It's very good advice. Thank you very much, Axel. Um, I think I'll just one very quick last question and then I'll hand over to Joe. Someone's asking about databases or contacts with universities that might have students or technical skills that um, could help ecologists carry out more effective mitigation translocations. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any, any thoughts about that. Obviously, again, as we said earlier, all of the links and the information and the sharing um, will be done after this um, symposium's finished. Um, Sam. Uh, yeah, just answering um, this again from my my previous role from my, rather than my current role. Um, but I think certainly approaching, there's quite a few master's courses in the UK that uh, have a, a real species recovery focus. Uh, obviously the one I previously ran is one of them. Um, not that I'm biased at all there, um, but also DICE as well. So where Richard is based. Um, so the, there's quite a few places that have that, that recovery focus and quite a few of them that have people who conduct research on conservation translocation. So those are a good starting point if you're looking for a really kind of translocation specific uh, bit of guidance um, or source of students to help with projects. Um, obviously for that kind of wider monitoring, I think a key one is I know a lot of graduates from our undergraduate courses and also from some of our other master's courses go into ecological consulting. So it might be that actually there is some skills in the workforce that are already unrealized um, that, and there may be people that are already present within the, the consultancy industry that, that would be very keen to kind of brush off some of those skills and get involved in that side of things. Um, but I think also as well is um, the conservation translocation specialist group is obviously a really good source of information to help with planning. Um, and then that might help give a little bit of an idea about you know, what specifically you might want to use students for. Um, but I think my key bit of advice would be just reach out to course leaders of those specific courses because they're always looking for projects for students um, and there are always students who are looking for placement opportunities as well. So you could get somebody for 12 months uh, rather than that shorter honours project or master's project length. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, and I think we're out of time for any more questions. And I am going to hand over to Joe, my co-chair, to do a sum up. Thank you. Thank you, Nida. Um, I'm not going to keep everybody very long as we are near the end of time. And I know it's, uh, for most of us anyway, it's a lovely sunny day out there, um, if you get the chance to go and enjoy that. Um, but I just wanted to say that I hope that you've all enjoyed what I've certainly found to be hugely interesting and informative talks that we've heard from a range of speakers today. And as has been mentioned, there are differences between conservation translocations and mitigation translocations. However, the principles should be the same and as much care should be taken for mitigation translocations as for those for conservation. So I really hope that today's symposium will have helped to highlight what you should be taking into consideration for all translocations, if you weren't already aware, and may contribute to increasing the conservation success of any translocations that you are undertaking or at the very least encourage you to read the IUCN guidelines and giving you some points of contact for help if you need them in the future. As has been mentioned already, all this, this sort of symposium has been recorded and we will be sending the links to the recordings to everybody that's registered for the uh, symposium. And we'll also be compiling some of the links to useful documents, websites, et cetera, that have been mentioned throughout the talks and through the answers to some of the, some of the questions. So all it remains for me to do is to thank all of our speakers for their time and for sharing their knowledge and experience today. Um, as I say, I found it hugely informative and I'm sure others have too. Um, I wanted to thank the rest of the uh, Species Survival uh, Working Group, um, my co-chair Nida and uh, the rest of the, the, the group that have been involved in organizing this symposium, but especially to Jelaine and to Louis, um, who've been two interns that have been working on this uh, symposium over the last three months and, and have done an absolutely brilliant job to, to bring this all together. And also thank you to Saeen for their technical expertise and collaboration on, on the symposium. And finally, just thanks for all of you for attending, um, for giving us your attention for the last few hours and for engaging through your questions. Thanks very much, everybody, and goodbye.